Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today, I'm really excited to have on Aaron Masako Wilkins. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Hey, Mason. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweet and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. You just came out with a book, well, I want to say within the past couple of years, it's called Asian American Herbalism. So we're going to chat a bunch about that. Uh, but mm -hmm. a lot of times I like to start these shows going way back. Um, and I know you kind of start your book chatting about your one of your grandmas, Masako. I'm just mm -hmm. kind of curious how she influenced your life, your herbalism, the way you see the world. So can you take us back maybe to hanging out in Masako's kitchen and and all of that? Yeah, oh, I, I, this is a great way to start. And thank you for that question. You know, uh, the way I think and the way I work is very circular. So we'll, I'm going to begin right in the middle of it all. Uh, in acupuncture school in my early 20s, uh, that's where my formal herbalist training started in a traditional Chinese medicine clinic surrounded by little wooden boxes with hundreds of herbs. Mm. And... In that program, in that clinic, I saw that many of the herbs on the wall were things that I recognized from my grandmother's kitchen. And that was such an um, important moment in my journey of becoming an herbalist is really connecting the clinical piece, the textbooks, and working with clients to some of my most precious childhood memories growing up in my grandma's kitchen uh, and so I chose early on in my practice to focus on herbs that grow well where, where we live in California. So chrysanthemum, mugwort, dandelion, loquat, honeysuckle, and then also herbs that again, in the, to the kitchen and to the local markets or Asian grocery stores, things we can find like burdock root, ginger, mint, citrus, green tea keeping it really simple. And I think that also speaks to kind of accessibility and herbalism. Totally. Um, so yeah, so my herbal journey now I look back and it did start in my grandma's kitchen, but I don't think I realized that when I entered herb school, I don't think I came into acupuncture and herb school with like, I'm an Asian American herbalist and <laughs> the identity piece came later on down the line. You mentioned low cup. Loquat, and I see Loquat all over your um, Instagram feed. And uh, I have almost no experience with that fruit. Uh, can you tell us why you love that plant? Yeah. So growing up uh, in local Asian markets, there is a kind of a classic TCM Loquat cough syrup. And it does exactly what you would think. Mm. It's a cough syrup. Um, however... When I ordered some, when my children were really young, it has artificial flavor in it. Mm. And one of my kids cannot. She will go cuckoo bananas with artificial flavor and color. So that was my first instinct. Like, oh, well, I wonder if I can make this. And so I did some research. And it's actually the loquat leaf that holds the most medicine. Mm. And also, and this ties into the Asian American herbalism piece, my mom has loquat trees in her backyard. So bingo, it's <laughs> easy to source. Uh, there, the, a recipe in the book is the syrup that I ended up making for my family. And it's kind of similar to making elderberry syrup, but instead of elderberries, I use dried or fresh loquat leaves, throw in a stick of cinnamon, a knob of ginger, uh, maybe some licorice root, and decoct that down, add honey. And it's actually really delicious. And I like to use it for a cough, but also just kind of to add into the mix during like cold and flu season. Yeah, that sounds delicious. Um, are there any other foods that your grandma would make that you kind of continue to this day to to make in the kitchen yourself? Yeah, you know, things like, um, of course, miso soup, mm, yeah. um, things that are just delicious. Totally. Um, adding seaweeds and mushrooms to just everyday rice bowls. But one thing that she still to this day drinks every day is gun my cha green tea. Oh, I love that tea. So good, savory. So good. That that toasted brown rice is a savory kind of flavor. Absolutely. 
Uh, and so like right now I'm drinking green tea and uh, what's really cool. And I, and I pulled this from some of the traditional Chinese medicine textbooks, green tea as a medicinal or an herb. But you don't always think of tea. I don't always think of tea as an herb. Right. Um, now I do. And I drink green tea because it is a chi tonic, meaning it helps to build or boost chi within the body or energy in our body. And I find it's really great for discernment. So yes, there's caffeine and it can kind of give that bump, but I really look at green tea as um, building chi and energy in the body and almost more importantly in, in the mind head. Yeah. Uh, I used to work for a company called Mountain Rose Herbs and I, they used to sell a uh, Gin Mai Cha and that was the, one of the first green teas that I really started falling in love with. Like you said, it's got like that toasty, savory flavor. Um, also, I just randomly saw earlier today that you follow the Eugene Tea Festival. I'm not sure if you if you went last year or not, but um, or if you're familiar with the event. I'm actually on the board of directors of that nonprofit, the Eugene Tea Festival. So, yeah, I just thought that was a cool connection. But um, do you do you go to these tea events? Do you um, teach at any of them? You know, I just found eugene tea festival and i followed them because i was like i want to i want to go yeah, you should. <laughs> i want to go that's why i started following um and i recently since the pandemic um built out a, a product line so herbal oh. tea asian american herbalism product line and so i'm also hoping in the future to go for fun and maybe also table share my wares totally. um, community uh, so I haven't been yet, but it, it actually is on my list of things I'd love to do. Awesome. Yeah. The Portland tea festival is also amazing as well. Um, so I'm actually interviewing the executive director, Madeline Al, um, uh, next week, I want to say, so to help promote that event, but definitely recommend checking it out. What a great, uh, tea community up there in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you mentioned herb school a couple of times. I'm curious, uh, was, was your herb school, an association with your acupuncture school or did you do acupuncture school? And did you, did you also have say like herb mentors on the side who have been some of your herbal mentors along your journey? Oh, yes. Um, probably the most important herb question you ask totally. folks is like, who are, who, who have we learned from? I love hearing the lineages, you know, it's always fascinating to me. Ah, so it, 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 it varies from state to state. I entered herbalism uh, clinically through acupuncture school. And in California, uh, the licensure, is it's acupuncture and herbs. So the schools have both. Other states, it can be separate. Okay. Um, and it's a good chunk. I would say like 25 to 30% of the acupuncture school I went to in Berkeley. It's the Acupuncture and Integrative Medicine College. Berkeley, California was, was herbs. Mm. Uh, so deep materia medica, learning the herbs uh, individually and then in Dwei Yao or in pairs and then mm. in formulas. And then also, of course, there was hundreds, maybe thousands of hours of, of clinical as well, which was really incredible. And I think a lot of the learning, a lot of learning takes place. And so within that program, uh, one of my greatest teachers it was Dr. Huang Xu, and she taught herbs. She had it actually, she, some people were quite scared of her. She had a reputation for being a <laughs> badass. So for some, like for myself, I was like, her, that's who I want to learn from. Were they intimidated <laughs> by her or her teaching methods were kind of like hardcore? Hardcore teaching methods, very uh, dogmatic, very strong in her perspective. And that really influenced she, her teaching. She was both a uh, allopathic or biomedicine trained doctor, OBGYN, and an acupuncturist herbalist um, trained in China. And so her teaching really influenced me, especially in my first five years of clinical practice after school yeah. of raw Chinese medicine decoctions uh, based on formulas, classical formulas. I wasn't really formulating myself in the beginning, which I think was valuable um, to to rely on the teachings of my mentor and then the generations before me. And so she just taught me that it's okay to 
be hard. It's okay to have strong opinions about the medicine and, um, and communicate with clients and patients that, you know, sometimes the most bitter medicine is the strongest medicine mm-hmm. and you're taking it because of these reasons and, and we want it to be effective. And so her teaching was, um, and still is so fundamental to who I am as an herbalist. Yeah. And then also there was another teacher, very different vibe in school. Hideko Peltzer, Japanese American. She taught more like Japanese energetic medicine, how to do acupuncture without putting a needle in the body. Um, and from her, I really learned the nuance and the cultural feeling of what is ultimately my ancestral medicine and Japanese um, herbalism. So the two, and both women teachers, uh, it's kind of like the yin and the yang Mm -hmm. of my mentorship. Okay. Thanks for sharing. (laughs) Well, uh, let's, uh, let's get into the book a little bit. Again, it's uh, Asian American herbalism. I don't know if there's a subtitle or not. (laughs) <laughs> there is a long subtitle the publishers <laughs> we do a subtitle traditional and modern healing practices for everyday wellness awesome so in chapter two you have a section called why asian american herbalism which almost seems more like a statement uh so i was hoping you could uh, chat a little bit about well why asian american herbalism uh, so early on in my practice, I just simply called my work East West Herbalism. So that was a really common sense way to describe what I was doing. Um, all of my work is rooted, centered in the East Asian, Chinese, and Japanese herbal tradition. But of course, with a modern day twist, just the practicalities of working in California, having learned in English, there's just so many nuances that don't make my work hard line traditional. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then it was during the pandemic 2020. And I had to shut down my brick and mortar herb shop and my acupuncture practice. I became a homeschool teacher to my young children. I was doing a lot of soul searching, I think. Sure. Maybe you can relate. Absolutely. I remember those days. Yeah, a lot of sitting in my yard with this like existential crisis. Um, and one of the things that came out of that that was really profound was looking at how I use language to describe what I do and who I am as a person. And I had this simple realization. I'm not an East-West person. I don't necessarily believe that herbalism is Eastern or Western. And I just had these words come to me. of like, I really identify as an Asian American herbalist. And as I started to kind of share about that, like on social media, I had colleagues and friends and folks in the Asian community come forward of like, hey, that really, that language speaks to me too. And so as I wrote the book, the question I kept referring to for myself is, what does it mean to practice traditional Asian herbalism in the context of modern, modern day life. Yeah. And that's what you seek to answer throughout the book. Um, yeah, I dig it. And, uh, on your Instagram, you uh, also posted this, uh, three principles of Asian American herbalists, which I know they're also in the book as well. Uh, so I was thinking we could just kind of go through those three principles and you kind of expound upon each one of them. Uh, so the first one we'll start with is heal locally. So what does that mean to you? You know, heal locally. So all of these principles, I wrote them at the end of the, oh, of really? the writing. I did. Okay. I wrote, every, I pulled out everything I knew. And then at the end I was like, okay, well, why does this matter? Yeah. <laughs> why do my tea recipes, what am I trying to say? Yeah. Um, and even that idea, heal locally, I think, as a fellow herbalist, there's just a gut reaction of like, well, duh. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all vibe with that already for sure. I like it though. <laughs> right. And yeah. like kind of thinking back to all of our ancestors, yeah. we weren't drop shipping herbs right. across the world. <laughs> right. Like yeah. I, I think it speaks to the roots of this medicine that we source from what we have available, whether it's in our kitchen, our garden, our community, 
I think that's how it's always gone down and spiritually speaks to this idea that, and I believe we share a resonance with the herbs that grow near us in our bioregion. You mentioned like dandelion earlier. How, how much are you talking about, say the weedy herbs, the weedy herbs in the book? Yeah, I would say the weeds, the weeds are the Queens. Definitely. Oh. Definitely. Uh, there's something that influenced my herbalism in my garden. So I am not a good gardener. Like I want, <laughs> I'm one of the like herbalists who, who do not fit into this like image of like having a beautiful garden on acres. <laughs> That's just not my reality right. in my herb garden to survive in my herb garden. You have to be able to come back each year with very little fuss. <laughs> water is coming from rain it's not right. <laughs> i'm right, right. not watering watering my garden so the weeds are what survive in my garden like yarrow calendula mugwort chrysanthemum uh dandelion those are all those are all key to my practice personally and professionally yeah i'm not sure if you're still uh selling uh Oh shoot! I forgot the name. This how is this happening to me right now? <laughs> Mug well mugwort, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. moxa. That's the word. Oh yeah. Do you yeah. um make moxa from the uh, mugwort that's growing in your yard, or because I know you used to sell those products, but I don't I don't think you do anymore. Or maybe I'm. Yeah, you know, my <laughs> product sales are kind of like this. I <laughs> okay, sure. I. I I'll tend to sell moxa if, when I'm teaching like moxa bustion classes a lot. Um, so depending on who's listening at any given moment in time. Okay. Maybe I might be. <laughs> um, I don't make moxa. It's such a labor intensive process. I think it's a worthwhile practice to try out for people who are interested in moxa bustion, which is um, a processed mugwort leaf that's used for heat therapy, kind of like burning a cottony incense over the body yeah and you're doing that in your acupuncture practice you're doing moxa. Yes. yeah okay yes awesome. and, and moxa bustion also is a really important piece of japanese mm -hmm. um acupuncture and healing traditions and so it's, it's just really spoken to me in my practice yeah i love that um I would love to talk to you later on if you'd be willing to. It's it's kind of a maybe a taboo subject, but I think it's an important one. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get to it later, but I'd like to hear you talk about, say, cultural appropriation versus appreciation. And the reason I bring that up is because I did read it in your book. You actually do address it. So I'd be curious your thoughts. But before we get there, why don't we keep sure. going through these three principles? Um, the second one you have here is for the earth. Yeah. You know, and... Again, had to really sit down and free write, pencil to paper. And what came forward was, I think even internally, I've had over the years this misconception that because herbal medicine is of the earth, that maybe it's a more ethical or, or earth-friendly type practice. But I found in sourcing, I, I mean, working for Mountain Rose, which is, I look at it as such like a ethical, incredible, like, like a leader in totally. ethical herbalism, you know? Absolutely. However, outside of that, we can source herbs from around the world where there might be human exploitation, environmental considerations, supply chain issues, quality issues. Um, and so sourcing from really ethical companies, brands, is, I think, is important as, as ever. Uh, so that's one piece, the sourcing. The other piece with climate collapse and increasing demand and over harvesting is I think we need to be vigilant, of course, of like threatened or endangered plants, like um, mm. the work like United Plant Savers is doing. And I'm sure there's so many more organizations doing this work Absolutely. too. Um, so considering not only the plants we're going to use or that we should be using, but what are the herbs that, we want to pass down to the next generation. Yeah. I think I heard in your, in your previous podcast that you're a father. Uh -huh. and so maybe yeah. that's something also that you're considering now as we're, as we're parents of like, okay, not, not just what are we using, but what, yeah. What are we sharing with our children? Absolutely. 
Yeah. I've always said, um, I want my daughter to take this herbal natural lifestyle for granted, um, which is kind of a weird way to say it. I kind of want her to just like have this be in the background. Like this is just, this is just how life is. And um, then she could focus on some other things. She doesn't have to be the herbalist. She's almost like say an herbalist by default, just because that's how she kind of grew up, you know, getting the nourishing herbal infusions all the time. Mm. So absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I shared that story one time with a, another herbal company and they, they misquoted me. They said they don't want her to take it for granted, but I, I do want her to take it for granted, which seems kind of <laughs> silly, but <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you mentioned um, uh, sourcing herbs and I actually was curious. I know you also are a fan of, is it Jujube date? Did I say that right? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. working at Mountain Rose Herbs, that's a herb we never sold. And I'm just kind of curious. Do you have a good ethical source for purchasing Jujube dates anywhere? You know, the um, the supplier for traditional Chinese herbs, uh, Springwind Herbs, you know, Springwind Herbs, San, Leand oh. and San Leandro uh bay area okay uh the person who runs that is andrew ellis or andy ellis he is one of the uh authors on the the major chinese herbal medicine textbooks and he is i mean he's such a badass i, okay. I really have so much respect for andy Sweet. he has personal relationships with the various farms he sources from in china and then once he gets in his herbs, he will act, he tests them again to make sure that they're of a high quality. And then he just is very transparent. These are organic. These are no detect pesticide. You know, these are conventional. And so for GGB dates, I would look to spring wind herbs. Okay. I will find them online or ask you to email me a link and I'll include that in the uh, podcast show notes and the YouTube description. So yeah, I've actually, cool. that's another one along with like Loqua. I've never had any experience with Jujube date just because I never was able to really source it. So um, I do have, what are those medjool dates upstairs right now? But uh, those are probably not the same thing. There's not, but they're, they're, it's relevant. Related? But some there's crossover medicinally. Okay. And what I'll also say about Jujube dates, I should have said first is that any Asian market in your community oh. will have them. I love the Asian market. Uh, I always uh, get kaffir lime leaves there, uh, lemongrass, <laughs> uh, and uh, what's the other one? The galangal root. Oh, yeah, I'll yes. look for the jujube dates next time. Yeah. Uh, so the third principle in your book is health justice. Mm. Mm-hmm. This is a big one, and it actually. Um, so before I was an herbalist, I was I, I almost went to law school. Oh, that would not have gone well for me. That's a different so always, career path. That's not how my brain works. But the my, the heart of why I wanted to do that was was a sense a uh, strong sense of justice and equity. And so when I started practicing acupuncture, I quickly realized the lack of accessibility, the kind of homogeny and the people who are able to come in, not just for awe treatment, but for consistent holistic care. And it coming from a very working class family, my grandparents were farm laborers. Um, I come from teachers and conservationists. Quickly, I realized ugh, access is, is an issue, can be an issue. Um, and so part of my teaching and writing, and even in this book was, uh, creating ways for people to access traditional knowledge that's been historically gatekept. And uh, in doing so and sharing freely, the hope is that for folks of Asian heritage, specifically to reclaim this medicine with really a sense of, of pride. Yeah. Because growing up Asian in America is not all butterflies and rainbows. There's a, there's a lot, I think, um, that model minority myth and being marginalized and having gone through various, not just um, bias, but like generational trauma. Mm -hmm. There's something really powerful about being able to see the beauty and significance of our culture through something like herbalism. You mentioned a uh, model minority myth and uh, yeah. is that, did I say that correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, as a, uh, straight white dude, you know, with all sorts of privilege. I, I've never actually heard model minority myth. So I'm just kind of curious if you explain to the audience what that is. 
Yeah. So the idea of the model minority is uh, that the, like, say, uh, Asian, specifically East Asian folk um, and our collective, say, successes and uh, are pitted against other minorities, uh, say, uh, Indigenous, Black, Brown folk. Right of it's not the s- systemic racism that's at play here because look at these folks who are maybe in like growing up I I knew I could be in law medicine engineering you know like and mm-hmm. a lot of my family is in those is in those realms and so it's a sense of like they're not suffering from racism like look at this like tiny percentage of people who are succeeding right. um, yeah so that, yeah, that makes not- sense an eloquent way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're a good example. I, I, I get it now. So, well, thank you. <laughs> example of it. Well, I want to read a, uh, a quote. It's like a review of your book. I'm going to read, I'm going to read the quote first about the book and then I'll say who wrote it. So someone wrote an absolute new favorite in my herbal library with countless tips for well being. <sighs> this book is meant to be used. <laughs> So you know who wrote that? <laughs> yes, I'm like I'm I'm sweating right now. I'm so <laughs> well. Congrats! Uh, that those were the words of Rosemary Gladstar. So, uh, yeah, what an honor to have her. You know, leave such a nice review of your book. So, can you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, be, living in Sonoma County, mm-hmm. uh, Rosemary Gladstar's influence in this region, specifically the. California School of Herbal Studies, Rosemary's Garden in Sebastopol, traditional medicinals, tea, her books. She is I, the OG. She's the godmother to me of Western North American herbalism. Is that fair? Absolutely fair. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, this woman and uh, my first ever book. I So I grew up in South Sacramento, which we'll call, say is hood adjacent. <laughs> And my grandpa Hiroshi at a little market, there was a health food section, you know, shampoos and different things. He bought me this book. Oh, wow. Rosemary's Family Herbals, the first. Classic. I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, so just on so many levels, her influence has really been profound in, in my world. Not directly, but through books and various things. And so I was really nervous to email her. But I did. I was like, oh, <laughs> shoot for the stars. Amen. And she uh, responded and she read it. And this woman, a literal angel on earth, I said in my email, I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but here are some chapters that I think are really good. And she wrote back after like a week, give me a week. She's like, I read the whole thing. Really? She didn't just kind of half-ass it, like, oh, yeah, great book. (laughs) I would have sent the cliff notes if I needed to, like, whatever you need, Rosemary. No, this, and just so generous. She wrote so so much feedback, Um, just so humbling. And, you know, before the book came out, I I told my husband, I was like, I don't need to sell a book. Right. I. (laughs) That's everything right there. This is it. I I am so honored and, and grateful. Well, dear listener, if Rosemary Gladstar loves the book, definitely go check it out. Is there a, we're, we're still going to talk though, Aaron. All right. So this isn't the end, end of the convo yet, but um, where would you like to send folks to learn more about the book and buy it and everything? Sure. So uh, my website, herbfolkshop.com, uh, there's a tab about the book and it's available anywhere books are sold. And I'm really I'm encouraging community and friends to call your local bookshop to, to order it. Awesome. Well, yeah, well, let's keep talking about the book. Anyways, um, I want to say in, in your book, you have a mushroom rice wine vinegar because uh, you posted about that on your Instagram account. You did a little video, which I'll also link to. Is that also at Herb Folk, by the way, your Instagram account? Oh, Instagram's at Herb Folk Medicine. Okay, good. We'll link to that as well. Uh, but this one really piqued my interest. It just seems delicious. So I'm just kind of curious if you could tell the audience what that recipe is, how you make it, and then um, how you use it. Sure. So the mushroom rice wine vinegar, it is a very simple recipe. I think it's in the seasonal wellness part of the book. And it speaks to the autumn season. 
And it's simply putting mushroom bits. It could be kitchen scraps. Ideally, it's kitchen scraps. We love totally. kind of that thrifty kitchen. Grandma medicine. would be proud. Yes, <laughs> she would. Um, it's definitely her vibe. Uh, and uh, so backing up, the essence, flavors of herbs and mushrooms really can be preserved quite nicely in vinegar. And so I like to use an unsweetened rice wine vinegar, chop up a few cups of mushrooms. It could be shiitake, maitake, lion's mane, button mushrooms, whatever is accessible. Yeah. Um, put it in a big glass jar and cover with unsweetened rice wine vinegar and a chopstick and kind of mix it up in there. Put a non-reactive lid and then every few days shake it. Um, and after two or four, two to four weeks, you can strain the mushrooms out and then just kind of put it in a beautiful bottle and have this whole experience with it. But honestly, personally, I'm like pouring off the vinegar when there's still mushrooms in it. Oh, <laughs> I'm yeah, just, totally. using, just kind of using it a little more loosey goosey. And what I love about this recipe is that. Rice wine vinegar is used in sushi. Mm. So making like onigiri or just uh, rice balls and seasoning it with some of the mushroom vinegar is really delicious. And it's a nice way to kind of get our, our herbs through our food. That's a great idea. Make the sushi with the mushroom infused vinegar. Uh, what are you doing with the leftover mushrooms? Are you chopping those up and cooking with them or do you just toss them or how do you work with those? Oh, interesting. I always toss them, compost. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't see any but reason why I guess you couldn't cook with them. Uh, I so maybe they have thought about that. Pickled mushroom. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm all about this thing called frugal nutrition. Get as much bang for your buck, as much nutrition as possible. And um, I think that'd be a good thing to do, potentially, you know? Especially with I, those hardier mushrooms. I love that idea. And, like, even dicing them up and then mixing them into the rice. Oh, with yeah. The vinegar and make... Now we're talking. Now we're talking. That'll go in the updated book edition. <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps. Um, exactly. Well, sweet. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, you you did a um in that recipe. I want to say you did shiitakes and lion's mane. Do you do you work with lion's mane very much? I do because I I there's a mushroom guy at our farmers market, and he always has lion's mane. Yeah. So for many Local. amongst other reasons, again that accessibility like oh i can get this let's use it absolutely uh are there any other plants you'd like to highlight or talk about um you know astragalus comes to mind reishi uh when i first started getting into herbalism i was really into tcm and i really liked hoshu wu aka fo tea um oh. so i'm just kind of curious if there's yeah if there's any particular uh plants or herbal remedies in the book that you'd like to highlight or talk about yeah you know i think so i do love the roots Astragalus, mm. Podenopsis, Reishi, uh, Peony Root. However, what it really gets me going is um, our herbs like chrysanthemum. I was going to ask you about chrysanthemum too, so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, we can get into roots, but I think if yeah. I had to share one thing, and I think this is a piece that's not um, maybe so common, mm. is... Herbs like chrysanthemum, if you look them up in the textbook, the TCM textbook, they are under the cold and flu section, release exterior. Other things in that section would be ginger, mint, uh, honeysuckle, and then in the Western North American tradition, I think like yarrow, elderflower, things like that. So the first indication is cold and flu, which is great. And yes, they serve that purpose. Well, the second indication is generally that they move chi. Mm. they move energy in the body and we know that chi or energy gets stuck when we're stressed out we can even maybe feel that um when we're stressed our, our bodies start to tense and especially right in our center mid back pain in the in the middle back things like that and so i love using these simple herbs that can be infused in a tea like chrysanthemum to buffer and build resilience to everyday stress. Uh, and then 
traditionally one more note on chrysanthemum, it's paired in a dui yao or a sister pair with goji berries, which at least in California, most markets will have dried goji berries and goji berries help to nourish fluids and blood in the body. And again, buffering and kind of creating this resilience to stress. So whereas chrysanthemum speaks to the chi or the energy, goji speaks to the blood and body fluid and together it's this uh yin yang balance i used to be so obsessed with goji berries uh back in the day <laughs> i probably spent like half my paycheck on goji berries <laughs> 20 30 bucks a pound or whatever it was I, <laughs> I feel like goji berries i mean they're still cool but they were yeah. hot remember that for yeah. a minute seriously i wonder what is the current hot herb i can't even really think of one i guess cannabis i don't know but um it just it just feels like there was never a time like when goji berry was just the it herb like 2010 i want to say something like that yes when i was in acupuncture school it was yeah. like there was even jokes and memes about it um i mean cannabis is kind of the evergreen like right. yeah, totally. gateway herb into herbalism totally um the hot herb well, during COVID, to me, being a TCM practitioner, it was Codenopsis, which really? is also known as poor man's ginseng. Uh, people were, you know, on Google, and I was getting some calls like, hey, do you carry Codenopsis? Yeah. Kind of surprising question right. to field. Um, yeah. Turmeric had a moment. I oh, feel that's like right. That's yeah. Wa that's waning, but it, yeah. it's on there. I don't know. Maybe a stragglist right now. For sure. Do you talk about Codenopsis in your book? I do a lot. Yeah. Um, the There's a huge section that's everyday ailments in the book, like anxiety, cold and flu, digestion. But my favorite section is prior to that is energetic healing, where I break down chi, blood, yin and yang, and herbs and recipes to cultivate wellness around those energetics and codenopsis is probably my top three herbs for that chi energetic healing so, yeah i'm going back to sustainability you you don't have to you know be harvesting ginseng you could get a lot of the same effect from codenopsis um, at least i don't know yeah. if you see it that way or yeah okay 100 percent same page i've never used ginseng in my clinical practice oh. i've always substituted codenopsis for that exact reason that's awesome yeah i want to say it probably has a lot of the same con constituents also when i worked at mountain rose herbs I, I would get codenopsis but then i'd also buy i don't know if it's pronounced gynostemma or gynostemma but i would i would always get gynostemma and that one had ginsenocides in it as well similar constituents but uh they were always out of stock of that so codenopsis <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's good when it's out of stock. Right, right exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely trendy for a bit there too. Mm -hmm. Are you looking it up? I am. Is that in TCM? Oh yeah, no, I'm not familiar with it. Mm. Uh, it's interesting. I did learn botanical names in school. I was a nerd that way, but I primarily learned pinyin which is the Romanized Chinese form. So sometimes I will, I'll just look up the botanical with pinyin and see. I've never heard that term before. So that's the um, TCM way of calling an herb as opposed to saying the, the genus or something like that. Yeah. So uh, for example, astragalus is Huang Qi, but I don't know Chinese characters. So it's written in Romanized or um, English letters. So sometimes uh, genuses become so common to say that i forget that that's actually the genus like astragalus is one yeah that's astragalus membranaceous or something and then gynostemma yeah i forgot that's actually the genus as well <laughs> yeah yeah well um do you have any advice to others that are looking to write either a book or an herbal book or anything like that how was that process for you i, I suspect everyone says it's incredibly challenging to to birth a book it was <laughs> I love that you say, again, these like parent <laughs> kind of connection. Right. I tell people birthing the book was more difficult for me personally than birthing my two children. <laughs> I don't doubt it. I stand, stand by that. Um, I would say that 
the best way to write a book is to start it now. Right. So I say that laughing, but truly I um, was writing and self-publishing little zines like very punk rock, like just stapling totally. zines, like in my office, again, that accessibility, how do we just get out this information? Uh, and so when a publisher and editor approached me about writing on Asian American herbalism, uh, she was, do you have writing samples? And I was able to say, yes, look at my beautiful zines. So that's, I think the biggest thing is that if you want to write a book, then do it. Yeah. And, um, Start with the things that are your real, like, um, how do you want to say? Start with the things that you think are most important to your experience and perspective. Don't hide those things away. And um, and then just start posting about things freely. I mean, it was social media that connected me with the editor. Um, and, yeah, so write it, share it. That's it. So the publisher found you like say through Instagram then, and then they reached out to you and said, Hey, do you want to write this book? Yeah. And I don't have a big Instagram following relatively. Um, it was right time, right place. And yeah. it was truly through networking on Instagram. Somebody who has a very big following uh, saw one of the workshops I was promoting. And so that's kind of how it all, it all went down. But uh, the, the, it wasn't because of my Instagram following per se. It was more because of how, what I was writing about the types of classes I was offering. Um, so that's a part of it too. And it really does take, I think it's so vulnerable and it can be so intimidating. I found it very intimidating to share so intimately and deeply of oneself. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's kind of what led to the book. Yeah, it's a very personal book for you. So I could see how that'd be healing in a lot of ways. And yeah, and thank you for bringing up, you don't have to have a large uh, Instagram following to to make a difference in the world. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of herbalists, very experienced herbalists out there that have no social media following and still are creating epic books uh, that'll be used for generations to come. So, and I, you know, I want to say, don't downplay it too much. You got at least 10,000 followers from what I saw earlier today. That's pretty solid. Yeah, <laughs> I think I was reading an article recently about cookbooks, uh -huh. uh, a, a news article about cookbooks. And they were saying that if you have over 100,000 followers, like you're guaranteed a book deal. And I was just like, what world do we live in? Right. Where it's not necessarily the our embodied experience and knowing it's fall. Anyway, so I agree. Social media, if you have a following, use it to your advantage. Yeah. Yeah. But Especially when uh, you could just buy followers, which leads to absolutely zero engagement. And so, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Someone has 100,000 followers and then you look at their page and they're getting like one or two likes per post. It's obvious that who's buying followers and who's not. <laughs> that, I didn't even realize you could buy followers, but oh. that makes so much sense yeah. that people would do that. And also, I think regardless of how you build, it is about, and I talk about community a lot. And I think one of the upsides of social media is you really, I found you can cultivate community connection through social, Yeah, you know, so yeah. Absolutely. Uh, is that kind of what herb folk means? Does that have to do with like the herb community or what does that, uh, the business name mean to you? Yeah. Uh, the idea of uh, first and foremost, folk medicine, mm -hmm. even though I come from a, clinical traditional Chinese medicine background, the heart of my practice is East Asian folk medicine. It's the medicine that we cultivate at home, mm -hmm. grandma's kitchen, garden, community spaces. And then also when I created Herb, the name Herb Folk, probably about 10 years ago, um, I was deep into like intersectional feminism and critical race theory. And uh, I liked it as a non-gendered term to talk about Oh, yeah. the community of herb people absolutely yeah. that was well, i guess you go for it that was the root of it i like it i guess since we're on the topic what else do you do through herb folk uh i want to say acupuncture clinical herbalist yeah mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. herbal products like what else do you do over there herb folk so uh 
I currently am not practicing acupuncture. Okay. With uh, the pandemic and shutting down my clinic, I haven't rebuilt that since, in part to finish writing the book and also just how much capital and how much energy it takes to start a brick and mortar business. So uh, I do offer some virtual herbal consultations. And then I have the product line. So that's Asian American herbalism and tea. This last year or 2023, I traveled to Japan for the first time. Nice. And which was, I mean, it was really, he- that was really healing. And I visited a tea farm in Southern Japan, Kyushu, which mm. is where my maternal lineage is, is from. Wow. And so, uh, built some like friendships there and I'm starting to import uh, just like a small amount of uh, different green teas from that region. So that's all on my website. Um, There's the book. And then I'm really excited and honored to be teaching at verse. We talked about um, online and then the uh, California school of verbal studies in Forestville. There's that Rosemary connection again, too. (laughs) I was telling you pre-call that I visited, well, we visited the California school. I want to say it was April, 2022, got to hang out with David Hoffman, but what a gorgeous campus. I mean, it was, it was raining the entire time we were there, but just like looking around was like absolutely incredible. So are you actually going there and teaching in person or are these like online offerings? I am. So at verse, it's all virtual again, incredible for accessibility. People are around the world tapping into verse. Awesome. The California School of Herbal Studies, to your point, I mean, just like even the learning garden right. and that being able to touch grass, as, as the youth say. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well played. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so when they brought me in to both schools to um, kind of step in for the previous traditional Chinese medicine teacher, both schools, and this was this is my, this is my brag, uh, invited me to teach Asian American herbalism, which again, I was sharing earlier in in our conversation, like is something that was such a profound shift in language for me just four years ago. So to be asked by schools that I respect so much to like, Hey, do you want to share on this is um, I'm so proud of that. That's amazing. Congrats on all your successes. This has been a quite the past couple of years for you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's been wild right it's been a wild ride i really like this uh call it the following the golden thread kind of like when you feel intuition or instinct you follow your curiosities and just like good things just start piling up and happening to you because you're you're just following your interests. you're following that golden thread and it just seems like you're a perfect example of someone who's been doing that i love that idea yeah. And just having the faith and the trust, because it can be scary. I would imagine I was watching kind of your your journey as well with Herb yeah. Rally and the community you've called in. And it, it can be quite scary, but I love that idea of like trusting that golden thread. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it got to the point where I would have these like nagging thoughts just over and over again, like these creative ideas, these bursts of energy of any time I would think about it, I'd get excited, but I would just push it back because I'd be scared or like, oh, that will never work. And then once I kind of just started going with it, everything just kind of fell into place. And I, you know, there's probably some luck to attribute to that, but at the same time, no, it, even if Herb Rally didn't end up where it is now, I would still, I think, be much happier for at least trying because then who wants to live with these regrets? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's like the harder you, the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? Right. Like, I like that. Just to like um, reflect what I see in your work is that there's a lot of people in the herb world in very different ways and yeah. your presence is, feels very authentic and Thank you. exciting. So congratulations as well thank you mm-hmm. i try to be i mean i um yeah it took me forever to work up the courage to just put myself even on camera i'm like but what if they don't like me <laughs> but um no it's um it's been quite the blessing so i i appreciate that it's feel free to you know not accept this question but i was uh you know reading in your book about the cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation 
And I just think that's such an important topic, especially to talk about in the herbal community. So if you've got some sort of statement on that, if you want to recall what you wrote in the book to some degree, um, could you share about that? Yeah. yeah. So I think the first, the first few things, an invitation for community and for us all to feel a sense of belonging. I think especially with something like traditional Chinese medicine, which is a historical, um, sophisticated system of medicine, not necessarily a, a spiritual practice. That in, um, knowing and that learning is available and accessible to everyone. And I think it stands to benefit people from, from every culture. Asian American herbalism, my, my greatest hope is that for people who are of Asian heritage, they see maybe their families, their life reflected in, in my words, and it gives them a sense of pride or maybe curiosity about digging deeper into their, their heritage. That is a beautiful thing. But even for people who don't identify as Asian, that my words and my writing might still inspire that sense of curiosity and joy, um, an interest in identity herbalism for themselves. Hmm. But I want to start there. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh what's up with cultural appropriation i think that's what i originally it got edited out through the through the uh rounds of edits but that was, it was like what's up with cultural appropriation it's more of a a question hmm. than a statement hmm. because i don't feel that i have the authority on like what's appropriate and what's not but i think it is important i appreciate you asking the question what to say about cultural appropriation or the kind of act of taking or misrepresenting or misusing elements from another culture specifically for financial gain mm -hmm. which is going on has been going on all since the beginning of time and it still is and uh i think this is really harmful when things are repackaged in a way or sold where it's not just removing the cultural context, but making it seem like the changes are going to make it more valid or cleaner or better. Uh, the disrespect, oh. that's where things really can cross a line. And I think where we maybe move towards cultural appreciation, because we can tear things down all day long. Well, like, well, where do we go from here? And the only thing that I've found that really sits well in my heart is this idea of a cross-cultural exchange, of doing the inner work, mm. of not just simply claiming, well, I've been given a pass or permission to do this work. And so that's what it is. More of a sense of like, hey, I've learned in this lineage, this tradition, this is the work I do. And this is what I'm bringing to it or these are the questions I have, or actually this is kind of where I've taken it and sharing in a, in a cross-cultural way and this idea of reciprocity um, to bring forward like that vulnerability and a mutual sharing, I think is, is the way kind of a, through and around cultural appropriation um, because there is herbalism from every culture that that knowledge and wisdom can benefit all of us. Yeah. So it's less about, I think, saying that's mine and more about saying, like, how can we share in a way that's really mutually beneficial and respectful? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, bringing up the money aspect definitely hits home. Like I think about certain people selling, you know, white sage. I feel like white sage is definitely one of those <sighs> hot button top topics and hot button topics. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's definitely been used, you know, for monetary gain for certain folks when maybe they shouldn't necessarily be selling white sage, but it's kind of yeah. what I think about. Yeah. 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 I don't think there's one answer. It's just, no. and even kind of tying back into the idea of Asian American herbalism, one of my fears in writing the book is that it would be perceived that I was trying to say that I was the authority on the Asian American experience or I have the final word on this is Asian American herbalism in a perfect box. Right. And really it's always been my intention and it remains that um, 
maybe this is, if not the start of the conversation, just a piece of the conversation into Asian American herbalism and just this idea of identity herbalism and cultivating a sense of our um, cultural connections to the earth. Absolutely. Yeah, the book for you was a very personal project. And I like that you're saying that you're not the final thought on this huge topic, which you could never write a long enough book about. I mean, there's so many different traditions and this is just your perspective. And yeah, I'm excited for the folks to to read it. And uh, so dear listener, please go support Aaron's work. Check out Asian American Herbalism at a bookshop near you. There it is for you YouTube listeners. Beautiful book, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, this has been a lot of fun, Aaron. Thanks for joining us. Uh, do you have any like parting words of advice for the audience or any closing thoughts before we uh, get out of here? Mm. If you are watching this on YouTube or you're on your phone, go outside and touch grass. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Get out there in nature, y'all. Very good. Perfect way to wrap up. So thanks once again, Aaron. Thanks y'all for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode of the Herbalist Hour. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for watching today's episode of the Herbalist Hour. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more great herbal content, be sure to subscribe to our Herb Rally YouTube channel. Uh, if you enjoy these Herbalist Hour episodes and you'd like to join us live, uh, you can do so by becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member. Uh, learn more at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And if you want to get your first 30 days for free, use coupon code YouTube30 at checkout. So our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members get access to exclusive video classes, monographs, and a lot more more herbal community discounts, um, along with joining these live Herbalist Hour interviews. So one more time, herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Enter coupon code YouTube30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. All right, we'll see you in the next episode and take care.